Okay, um, got a lot to fit into the allotted 45 minutes. And uh, just really quick, uh, luckily Pete um, and some of the other speakers asked a little about the audience. I understand who's new, who's experienced. But just give me a feel. Where do you think your headaches are? How many people are worried about protecting their ideas, intellectual property, or just knockoffs? You got the greatest thing on Amazon, and now somebody else tries to copy it. How many people are worried about that kind of stuff? OK, a couple. And uh, everybody wants a good price, so I won't even ask. But how many people are worried about quality control? Is that at the top? All right, I'll, I'll, luckily we've got some great speakers coming up later in the week, and I'll cover qual quality control. Um, I hate it when I go to a conference and the presenter talks about how great they are and why you should hire them. So I'm going to keep the sales to a, a minimum. If you want to learn more about my company, the, the website is, is down there. Also, I don't like going to a, especially a China conference and the person claims to be an expert. You know, I, I moved to Asia as an exchange student in 93. Um, a wife, two children, uh, we had up to 200 employees at one time. I'm still here, but I don't claim to be an expert on China. I make mistakes all the time in business and language and culture. So really, like the earlier speakers, I'm just here to give you some advice, share the mistakes that I've made, as well as uh, learn from the audience. And I make mistakes every day. Just to tell you how embarrassing it can be, um, I'll give a short one. I, I studied language back in the 90s in, in Heilongjiang province for a couple years, and I just started my sourcing agency, and I wanted to show off with a supplier. So I had a little bit of a cold. You know, the pollution was rough back then, and coal in the air. I'm like, okay, stop at this pharmacy. I'm going to go in, and, and I'll order the medicine myself. And the supplier's like, are you sure? Do you know your way around Chinese medicine? I'm like, no problem. I got this. You know, come with me if you're worried. So I go in there, going to show off my fancy Mandarin. And uh, I said clearly and perfectly, um, I, my body's a little bit sore. I've been having sex with cats. So the, <laughs> this, uh, just, <laughs> the, the point is, I'm still doing business with that supplier. So don't worry about dropping food with your chopsticks or saying crazy stuff. The money's in your pocket as the buyer. So relax when you're, when you're going on these sourcing missions. So um, with, with that out of the way, let me tell you a little bit about what I've been doing and, and why I've been asked to present today. Um, I started a company out of my, called Passage Maker out of my apartment in Shenzhen, I think, 16 years ago. And um, you know, we started as a sourcing agency, helping buyers find and manage their suppliers. But the core of our business is well, you've heard of virtual offices and virtual assistants. We set up virtual factories. So our customers want to have hands on the ground in China to kit things together, protect intellectual property, um, do private labeling, branding. Or they want to have people on the ground to manage their supply chain, but the client doesn't want to set up their own office in China, doesn't want to deal with local tax issues. So we break off space within our front office in Lohu, Shenzhen, or our assembly center to make like mini factories within our factory. Well, um, you know, that's enough about my, my business model. But over lunch and in, in some of the questions, this issue of agent has come up a lot. So before I dive into the presentation, I just want to address, you know, um, some of the questions were, answered over, were asked of me over lunch were like, Mike, wow, some of the presenters um, earlier you know, had 35 steps for going from your idea to getting it into fulfillment. And uh, you know, Ash, he presented all the different issues. And I know some of the people in the audience were like, well, that's overwhelming. You know, I thought it was just enough to have a good idea and a great product. Sadly, it's not. You know, there's um, crowdfunding issues. There's of course, the sourcing and supply chain management, and then you've got the Amazon fulfillment. So sometimes an agent is brought in or a representative to assist in those areas. I caution you to assume the worst um, anytime there's an agent involved in Asia, whether they're a foreign agent with a face that you recognize or a local agent. Um, you know, there's no code of conduct. There's no better business bureau. It's totally unregulated. So you know, be very careful. Just like the earlier presenters talked about how important it is to qualify a supplier, the same is true for agents. So you actually have to do dil due diligence on the people who do are doing due diligence for you. That's a mouthful. So you know, it's not enough that they're bilingual and on the ground in China. In terms of infrastructure, they need things like ideally, you know, they're ISO certified so that you can say to your customers, yes, the team that's putting our product together in China is ISO certified, or they have the FDA or CARE. We also have BSCI. Um, ideally, an, an earlier speaker touched upon this. Um, he was 
finding the factory and then finding a logistics company, well, your agent, if they're getting involved, they should have their own import-export license so that they don't have to hire a third party and give them 5% to uh, arrange the import-export. So it's important that your partners have the proper licensing in China. It gets a little bit technical. Um, probably most important is they have a proper system and have some skin in the game. There are a lot of agents that say, yeah, we'll help you in China. And then, okay, what if you mess up? You know, is there a warranty? Are you just going to blame it on the supplier? So if you'd work with an agent, make sure that they're, uh, they're committed to working with you. Luckily, the agents that are here today are very professional. And, um, you know, but if you just go online, Google sourcing agent, wow, there's, you, you need to be really careful. Okay, with, with that out of the way, let's dive into the main subject. Um, Pete put me on the spot before and said, Mike, in a couple slides, tell everybody how to find the right factory. Well, it's, that's been about 16 years, and I wrote a book called The Essential Reference Guide to China Sourcing that's 300 pages. And uh, at the Global Sources um, New Buyer Education page, I put the uh, 30 pages down to 10 videos. Also did a course that I'll tell you about later. But now I'm going to put it into a PowerPoint. Okay, so here's uh, 18 years crushed down into one PowerPoint. Here are the basic steps. Um, we, in earlier presenters talked about um, you know, defining what you want in terms of your product. That's essential. But also think about defining what the dream supplier would look like. Because if everybody in the audience is buying watches, we will still have different suppliers. Some of us need Japanese uh, mechanism. Others need Brazilian leather. Others want uh, 100,000 units. Others want 10,000 units. Some are just buying 10. So even if we're all buying the same product, our dream supplier will be different. So write down what's important. This supplier needs to have access to you know, Brazilian leather, or they need to be in greater Shenzhen so that they can consolidate freight with my Guangzhou supplier. Whatever it is, you got to list out what your supplier, um, dream supplier would look like. And I'm saying supplier, but I'm really meaning factory in this case. So let's assume that you're not buying from a trading company or hold, ho wholesaler, that you're looking for a manufacturer or factory. So the first step is, you know, what are the desired attributes? Um, and then you go online. If you're buying watches, you know, there's going to be hundreds of suppliers at globalsources.com or at the fashion trade show. So it's a mistake to not be picky and just say, all right, my boss sent me over here. I've got one week at the trade show to find a supplier, negotiate a contract, and then I'm going to fly back home and everything's going to be great. It, it doesn't work like that. Usually the first couple suppliers that you meet aren't the best in this massive market of China. So as buyers, it's up to us to do our homework. So how do I go from 100 suppliers at globalsources.com down to the right ones? Well, don't do this. Don't have um, like three piles of potential suppliers. You've got your clearly not a good fit, and then you've got your um, a good fit, and then in the big middle pile is maybe. And you start convincing yourself, well, maybe if I work with a supplier that's got a good price, I can convince them to understand my specs. You know, just put the maybe pile in the no pile and realize that China is so big that there is the ideal supplier out there for you, whether it's a small supplier or a large one. So, so keep looking. Um, please don't focus on price. You've heard this from the other speakers, but I'd like to emphasize it. If you focus on price alone, you will be, you know, don't be seduced by the siren song of low price. What happens is in my you know, 18 years of doing this, I've, I very rarely is that the lowest cost supplier is also the best supplier. Because you need to look at the cost of defects, the cost of project management, you know, travel to the suppliers. So, and also, if you focus on price too early, um, the supplier is going to adjust their quality levels to meet your pricing. And we'll talk about that later. OK, so now you've been really picky, and you've got it down to, say, 5 to 15 suppliers. Then you actually introduce yourself. Don't make the mistake, and I skipped over this, sorry. Don't contact 100 suppliers and say, send me your product information. You'll spend your whole trip just looking at emails. So you know, narrow it down and then have a, a deep discussion with a handful of highly qualified potential partners. That brings you down to um, about five. And then on the top two or three, uh, do your audits and due diligence. Now, we'll talk about different levels of due diligence, but I'm basically referring to um, confirmation or verification that what they're telling you is accurate. If the supplier says they have 500 employees and that they have 10 injection plastic machines and they export 50% of their product to Japan, and if that's important for you, you better verify that it's true before you sign a contract. 
Don't skip number five, that's the test order. So many buyers, especially if your product is seasonal or you're on a, on a, you've been given an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary timeline where you gotta get products out, you know, don't rush the, the test order. So important, not just to make sure if the supplier can make the widget that you think they can make, but also any hiccups at customs, any, you know, are your customers happy with it? That first test order is so important, so don't jump right to the full order. Okay, there's, uh, <laughs> that, that's one slide for how to find the dream supplier, because it's easy to find a, a supplier, but it's a lot harder to find the right supplier. Okay. Um, Luckily at a trade show, because the exhibitors have paid so much money to be here and come across the border and get passports and visas, it's highly unlikely, I have never heard of it, that a buyer at this trade show starting tomorrow has run into a scam artist. By scam artist, I mean someone that pretends they're a seller, but they're just you know, a guy operating out of a, out of a fake bank account that's gonna disappear. So, but often I'm contacted by buyers and say, Mike, this supplier scammed me. Okay, tell me what happened. Oh, really? You, you didn't uh, do an inspection? You didn't do an audit? You didn't have a proper purchase order, let alone one that's in Chinese? So there is a difference between getting scammed and being an inexperienced buyer that comes back to haunt you. Yeah, there are some sloppy suppliers out there, but if you're a professional buyer, often you can um, maybe hold the hand of a, a supplier and, and make... you make them better. You can't take a bad supplier and make them great, but you can take a bad supplier and make them good or a good supplier and, and make them great. So when I was asked to cover scams, I want to make it clear that the suppliers that you're meeting at the show, and I don't work for Global Sources, but it's fair to say this, they're not scams. You go onto Google and type in watch manufacturer Shenzhen, be really careful. So there are definitely scams out there. Now you're at high risk to a scam or more importantly, to a bad situation, something going wrong with your, what appears to be a le legit supplier, if you fall into these categories. If you're one of the so-called e-buyers, where you think, um, okay, I can do all this online, I don't need to go to China, I don't, maybe I go to a trade show, but I don't visit the factory, I can um, you know, just do it all digitally, that's really dangerous for reasons that we'll explain later. Also, if your orders are small, um, you know, y you're, you're at risk because the, buy, the sellers know that, okay, if you're buying a couple thousand dollars and they do you wrong, you're not gonna spend a few thousand dollars more on a local lawyer to go after them. So know that if you are a small buyer, you are a target. Not necessarily for scams, but for the supplier to say, okay, you know, we're, I know we've got some defects in here, let's hide them a little bit. Maybe the customer finds them, maybe they don't. What's the worst they're gonna do? Sue us? Probably not. So, you know, when you're small, it's no secret, the bigger you get in, in buying power, the easier it is to do business with China. It's really hard to start small. Okay, <clears throat> you know, some of you might be dealing in components. You know, um, realize that the, the manufacturer might say, oh yeah, this is $50 microphone because it has a Sony battery in it. Okay, well, a lot of components can be faked. <laughs> And um, you know, you're at high risk if you're paying a lot of money for something that you think is certified or um, official componentry. So it's not just the finished product that you have to be worried about, it's also at the component level. Um, and then you're at high risk if you have sloppy buying practices. And these are the most dangerous sloppy buying practices. You don't audit the factory up front. You don't do any inspection because you say, oh, my order's only $2,000, why should I spend $300 on, um, on third-party QC. You know, take your $2,000 and go to Macau. You'll have better odds at the casino. So don't, um, don't skip on QC, and QC's not expensive. Um, don't skip on the upfront auditing, and please, please use a contract. I don't care how small the order is. When you send an email to someone and says, I want 500 units of this watch, and here's my bank transfer for the deposit, that's not a purchase order. If things go wrong, you can't go to a court in China or have a demand letter issued from a lawyer um, based on that email chain. You know, things need to be official. Ideally, it's a bilingual purchase order. At the very least, it's a clear written agreement that has been chopped by the Chinese factory. So they've got, you know, they, they are exposed. And, you know, if you're small, you might think, well, I don't have time to set up contracts and things. Well, when you set up a contract, even if you are a small order buyer, it shows the supplier that you're not going to be a pushover, that you are serious about your intentions of doing things the right way. And that alone um, could protect you. 
Okay, now here's some real good news, because I, I see some people getting scared. It's really easy to avoid problems with suppliers. And I don't want to be up here saying, oh, Chinese suppliers are terrible, you're going to lose money. No way. I, I've been in business all this time. I have some suppliers that are a pleasure to work with. Most of the vendors that I deal with are, are um, highly qualified, and we make a decent money together. But I did my homework up front, and I follow, some, um, I, I follow these rules of thumb. You know, don't focus on price up front, obviously, do your research. It doesn't cost you any money to ask the sellers, give me a reference. Now they might say, oh, but we can't give you another, you're Canadian and we can't give you a North American reference because of uh, conflicts of interest. Okay, give me an Australian customer, give me somebody, give me a friend. You know, if, if the seller can't come up with at least one happy customer that, that they can trust to talk to you, that's a, a big red flag run away. And I've had the uh, reference tell me, well, things are going good, but the last six months, someone, something changed in the quality department and don't order from this supplier. So follow up on the reference as well. Um, we've, in the earlier speakers talked about it, but you have your, your specifications very clear. And uh, once the, if you're dealing with a supplier that maybe isn't professional, they see that your quality requirements are serious and it's tied to a contract, they might back away from the order. That's great. The last thing you want is to pay money to a supplier that can't fulfill their obligations. So it's good to hear about it early rather than later. Um, structure your payments to performance. What I mean by this is whether you're dealing with 50-50 uh, you know, payment terms, I use 30-40-30 all the time, or 30-70, the payment terms, while well, they're nice for cash flow, but they don't really protect you unless they're linked to some type of action. So if I'm going to give a 30, let's keep it simple, 30, 70. So I'll pay that 30% upfront deposit, but in exchange for me giving the deposit, I want proof, send me a couple pictures or let me audit the factory, that the raw materials for my order have been purchased with that 30%. So I want to get something for helping the supplier finance the, the order. Um, now when that 70% is ready to be paid, um, don't make this common mistake. Don't say, all right, we'll give you the 70% after provision of documents, the bill of lading, meaning the product is ready on the boat and shipped. I've had suppliers send boxes of rocks to the buyers because the buyer negotiated, I'll make the payment when the um, bill of lading is provided. So they shipped rocks knowingly in that because they were going to miss the lead time. So they said, all right, just get the money out. We'll, we'll get this money in, and then we'll remake it later when we have an opportunity in our schedule. Doesn't happen a lot, but I know boxes of rock have, have been sent. So be careful, and when you structure your final payment or your 70% payment, it's after third-party QC or after you've had a chance to visit the factory. Simply putting into your agreements with the supplier that you're planning to come to the factory, even if you don't. If you make the impression that you or a third party is going to come and, and audit, I'm sorry, inspect before the goods leave, you would be surprised how um, the level of quality can suddenly come up. Okay, um, who are you paying? This is a, a great way to avoid all scams and most bad suppliers. You might do this. You might have a factory that you meet in mainland China and your orders, you know, they're not huge, maybe they're under $100,000, so the supplier says, hey, you know, I'll avoid, I can give you a discount a little bit because I'll avoid um, a lot of uh, currency conversion issues into mainland China if you just pay me to our Hong Kong headquarters, or you pay the money to my, my CFO's personal account. And it sounds great, yeah, eh, it's only $5,000, let's get the order going, yeah, I'll, I'll do them this favor. The supplier might not be out to trick you, um, maybe they actually are saving a little bit of money on avoiding the um, exchange rate fees and things. But if anything goes wrong, your hands are tied because you will say, okay, I've got a purchase order with this Dongguan supplier. I've paid them money. Now I want to issue a demand letter because they've done me wrong or I want to take them to court. The judge is going to say, okay, show me your contract. Bam, here it is. And then the seller is going to say, yeah, I signed this contract, but we never received funds in our account. Is that true, Mr. Buyer? Yeah, we sent the money to this Hong Kong company. Hong Kong company gets dragged in. 
oh, yeah, strangest thing. Six months ago, we received money out of the blue. We don't know where it came from. We don't have a contract with any companies overseas. And so you can't link the two. So be really careful. Make sure that the name on the contract matches the name on the bank account, um, ideally matches the name hanging at the factory wall. If those three things are the same in Chinese, Take a deep breath and realize you've probably avoided 80% of, of potential problems. Okay, um, I visit this website every morning just because it, when I make mistakes, it helps me feel better when I see that other people are making the same mistake. So um, if, if you have a good supplier, keep that close. But if you found a bad supplier and they've done you wrong and maybe you can't go after them in a court of law but you want some emotional satisfaction, list them at supplier blacklist and, and let's uh, share, uh, share this notice. Okay, um, you know, verify the verifications. Um, when the suppliers are here, you know, they paid a lot to be at the show. They're in the Global Sources Network. They're verified suppliers. But if you just meet a supplier on Google and they have a logo that says Global Sources Verified Supplier on their homepage, how easy is it to Photoshop stuff? ISO, you know, Global Sources Preferred Partner. You know, you need to go to the Global Sources website or to the ISO registration board and verify that what the, su the supplier has on their website is actually true. So, you know, just because the supplier says that they're a seven-star supplier on their own website, that's a little different than if they're listed under the seven-star suppliers at Global Sources, for example. So know that it's really easy to Photoshop stuff in China. ISO, ISO certificates, FDA, Walmart purchase orders. Um, okay. Now, now that we've gotten the scams and the bad suppliers out of the way, uh, how do we verify that the, um, the seller is legit? And this is a common question, and it might mean different things to different people. Usually it means one of two things. Are they legitimate in their quality? Do they have the, the ability to make the product that I want? Because that's different from are they a legitimate business, meaning they're not a scam, they're a real company. Because a real company you know, can, can, can send you a box of rocks. Um, but they're still a legit company. So let's focus on legit quality first, and um, Habib from Asia Quality Focus will be speaking later in the week. He'll cover these in depth. But just to get, give you a primer a little bit, um, you know, if you want to confirm is the factory legit in terms of quality, well, you do an audit. Well, what's an audit? You know, an audit can be, you know, for, you find people online, freelancers, that'll do it for like $90. You pay for their plane, I'm sorry, your, their bus ticket, and they go to the factory, they look around. Okay, yeah, there's a building here. It appears to be owned by Mr. Wong. If that's enough for you, great. Consider that an audit. But if you're serious about doing business with a supplier, you, have, um, you need to make sure, in your case, let's say you're dealing with watches, and you want to make sure that the leather is Brazilian, and that they have a certain so count. Well, you know, then your audit should take those things into account. So an audit can range from a very detailed, you know, um, ISO, intense audit to just, hey, is there a factory here, not a field? So know that there are different audits at different pricing. Social audit is if you needed, uh, maybe you're putting Disney on your product or you're selling into a green, uh, you have customers that care about, um, you know, are things green, is, the, is it a sweatshop, that kind of stuff. So the really good news is, no matter, as long as you're dealing with a professional company, factory audits are a couple hundred dollars a day, maybe five, 500. Social audits are about the same, maybe a little bit more. So affordable tools, even after you know, um, 15 years in business, I still use third parties to do audits because it's a lot quicker for, for me to pay them a single fee to go visit the, the factory rather than fly my team in from headquarters in South China. Okay, testing, inspection, obviously important. Um, people often, if you're new, you might confuse audit, testing, inspection. An audit is a, is a look at the process, the factory. And don't confuse ISO with quality. ISO is the quality of the system. So you could have a supplier that is ISO compliant making concrete life jackets. Now they keep all of the, the documentation, they manage the raw material, they do in-process inspection, final inspection. But you jump into a lake with a concrete life jacket on, that's not going to be a quality product or a quality experience. So audit is the system, not the product. Testing and inspection are looking at the product. Now, you, testing is like you take something, let's send this to the laboratory, put it in a hot environment and see if the battery leaks. You know, something like that, whatever your requirements are. 
But you can't test 100% of your product, most likely, unless you're buying small, really, really small volume. So inspection is a statistically reliable sample size that the uh, shipment matches the pre-agreed specification. So it's really important that you get these three, because as you're talking to your inspection agent or you're talking to your suppliers, if you're saying inspection and they're thinking audit, it can really get confusing. So audits, testing, and inspection. OK. Um, are they a legit business? And you know, there are services. We run something called a red flag assessment, a couple hundred bucks to find out who owns this factory, what's their reputation. But you don't want to hear about paid services. So let me give you some free tools to determine if the supplier is legit in terms of are they a real factory. Um, first off, and I don't know why every buyer doesn't do this, ask the supplier, hey, show me your written quality manual. Now, you can't do that with a trading company, but if you're dealing with a real factory, a real manufacturer, if they don't have a written quality manual, run away. Because uh, the quality manual is like a, it's a training manual. It's all the specs into one package. It may have the engineering degrees. It's go, no go gauges. So um, the factory, will, if they're sloppy, they will say to you this. Oh, Mike, we don't need a written quality manual. We've been making watches for five years. Our staff are well-trained, and they, knew what to, they know what to do every day. OK, what happens if you have a flood and you need to move your, your product? What happens if after Chinese New Year, 15% of your workforce decides to stay home rather than come back to the factory? What happens if your QC engineer decides that he's going to start his own watch company next door and takes your best three uh, quality engineers? Those things happen every day in China. So if your supplier doesn't have a written way of managing the production of your product, it's really scary. And I wanted to bring one with you to show it to you as a benchmark, but these documents are, you know, 20, 30 pages long. If you visit my website uh, at Passage Maker, PSS China, under the uh, About Us, down at the bottom, scroll down, it says uh, Assembly Inspection Documentation, and you can download our Product Quality Manual PDF bilingual so you can get a feel for, hey, what, what should a quality manual look like? And as I mentioned before, it doesn't cost anything to ask for references, so pl please, please do that. Okay. Um, Quality is going to be covered later in the week, but just a couple things on this slide, and then I'll skip to more important parts. When I go into a factory, um, the, what separates the good factories from the great factories down in the middle here is traceability. Traceability means, OK, I'll tell you what's not traceability. So many factories, they realize that you have quality control requirements, and maybe you agree on a finished standard. So they make the product, and then they put all of their QC people at the end of the assembly line, and they basically sort the good from the bad. They'll end up passing on the defective cost to you one way or another. So the professional factory that has traceability will have quality points in process, especially when the raw materials come in, so that they don't spend a lot of their labor on working on defective parts. That's what separates a good factory from a bad factory. And if, God forbid, you have a recall situation or it turns out that that watch that you bought has uh, fake leather rather than Brazilian leather, if the factory has traceability, they can go back to their inbound raw material and try to isolate the scope of the damage. Was it 100% of the bands have problems or just 10%? So traceability, the ability to know what materials are being assembled, what people are working on it, where did it ship, that's what separates the good factories from the, the great ones. I, I love ISO system. ISO, um, you know, it costs about $4,000 if you want to bribe an ISO inspector and get a badge for your factory that says, we're ISO compliant. You go into a lot of factories with a big red banner, you know, we've been ISO, we're ISO certified. And even if they were legitimately ISO certified, sometimes it's just a marketing ploy. So I love to go in and say, all right, you know, show me how your ISO system operates. Show me some of your documentation for the past few years. Who's your ISO uh, compliance officer? And the factories that are really living and breathing the ISO system, they'll talk your ear off about how important it is, and they'll show you around. You'll know really quick, without being an expert on ISO, it takes like two minutes to find out if a factory is really ISO or just ISO for marketing. Okay. All right, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, suppliers and contracts, and here are four dangerous assumptions. Um, never assume that the factory is a manufacturer um, until proven otherwise. What I mean is there's a lot of businesses that have uh, manufacturer in their business license, but basically they're bringing in semi-finished goods or components or even finished goods and just providing some, some labor to put it together. 
Now, if you're buying a widget with not a lot of technology or intellectual property, it's okay to work with these workshops as long as they have decent quality. But if you have something unique, highly customized with intellectual property protect, and you're dealing with this workshop that then behind the scenes has 10 manufacturers making the different components, that can be really dangerous because you've lost control of over who has access to your private, your sensitive information. Plus, if you want to get involved at the engineering level or at the actual manufacturing level to tweak things, it's really hard because that workshop is worried that you're going to cut, cut them out of the loop and go direct to the actual manufacturer. So when people say, yeah, I, I own a factory, tell me a bit about it. Is it assembly location or is it hardcore manufacturing where you own the means of production, the equipment, or is it just a couple hands and set of tools? Okay, um, realize that China is relationship-based rather than contract-based in terms of contracts. Coming from the U.S., you know, the typical way we do business is we come in with a 40-page uh, contract that's, you know, a lawyer has spent thousands of dollars preparing it, and the assumption is when the other party signs it that they really uh, have read it and understand the terms. Don't make that assumption in China. I've had suppliers early on in my career where I gave them that 40-page document, and I assumed, okay, if they're going to sign it, it's their responsibility to translate it and understand it. And if they have any questions, they'll ask me. <laughs> I learned the, wrong, learned the hard way. I had a supplier on the, tw at the, like, the day before I had to ship a really big unit, like hundreds of thousands of dollars of car parts, and it had to be there to the, um, to the store. And the day before, the supplier calls me up and says, Mike, I know we've got a contract in place, but we're friends. Remember how we, I took you to dinner and you drank that by Joe and you went seeing karaoke? So I, we're friends, and I know you think the contract's important, but here it's all about the relationship. And, and I had a bigger customer come in for $2 million. Do you mind if, if I put your order on delay for a couple weeks? Like, you know, that totally breaks the contract. Luckily, in the contract, I wrote that if it's delayed, uh, each day I get 1% discount. So suddenly they found a way to get me to this, the front of the supply line. So long story short, don't assume that just because you have a contract that it's being respected. The way to get a contract respected is to keep it simple. Now my contracts are never more than two pages long. They're bilingual, and it's more like a memo of understanding that has been signed by both sides. So I have a, sec a sentence in English, a sentence in Chinese. If it's an important project for me, I sit down with the owner of the factory, have as many of his employees as I can get into the room, and I go through each point by point. The reason I have all the employees in the room is not so much so that um, they understand. It's so that they see the boss signing off on key points, like, this is my proprietary product. I don't want you selling it to Walmart. Mr. Wong, is that OK? Yep, we're all good. Sign. Now, next year, if Walmart knocks on the door and Mr. Wong sells to Walmart, all of his key employees know that this is a guy that can't be trusted, that broke his word. So he's losing the, the face. And that actually carries more weight than the contract by itself. Okay, so uh, don't assume that the, that the contract is read, understood, signed, and respected. You know, the supplier knows that if, you sign, if they sign this contract, they're going to get their, your money. You're going to make the first payment. The order starts. So naturally, they want to sign and make you happy. Take a step back, walk them through. Okay, um, so many times the salespeople at the show, you know, they're eager to get the orders going. Yeah, maybe they take your small order at first, but then later you learn that, okay, they, they weren't really in the watch business. They really wanted to be in smart watches, and they're not interested in my old product. So you really have to make sure the interests are aligned. Um, you know, like f five years ago when the real estate market was going very well, I would get a couple beers in my suppliers and I would talk to the owner and say, hey, you know, Mr. Wong, what's the real plan? What do you want to do with your company in five years? He's like, manufacturing is tough. I'm trying to make as much money as I can so I can buy an apartment building in Zhejiang and get out of the manufacturing business. You know, okay, all right, maybe if I got a couple orders that I need to get in the next year, that might work. But if you're looking for a long-term strategic partner, that, that's not the right guy. So, you know, factories can, change, can pivot on um, a dime. I remember I went in and visited a factory that was making rubber molding parts, and I came back a year, and they were making uh, electronics with circuits. So, you know... I wouldn't want to be the first customer of the circuitry, but after a while, you know, they're still in business. But um, you know, ask questions. What's your long term? Are we a good partner for you in size? I don't exaggerate my orders. I don't go in and say, I'm a big buyer from America. I'm going to give you a million dollar order, unless I really can. Usually I say, hey, 
all right, this order is kind of small, but my customer has some interesting technology that they're willing to share with you, or we can get you into a new market that you haven't gotten into before, Mr. Supplier. So you can find ways to get the, the interests aligned and, and make you an attractive buyer, uh, regardless of your size. Okay, let's talk about contracts. As I mentioned before, you know, they got to be easy to understand, leverage face, more than a purchase order number. What I mean is, you, know, you hear about guanxi all the time and how important it is to be a good relationship. Well, it doesn't take much to build good guanxi. You, know, you don't have to bring extravagant gifts when you visit the factory. You know, I might bring a, um, you know, this is what I do a lot. If the supplier is important to me um, and they have children, their children and my children can be pen pals, that helps a lot. I, I grew up outside of Buffalo, so I say to all my suppliers, you know, especially if they've been a good host to me in China, I'd like to return the favor. Please come to upstate New York, let me give you a tour, personal tour of Niagara Falls, take you out on the Finger Lakes. In 16 years, the suppliers have never taken me up on that offer, but they really appreciate that I offered it to them. I've helped um, you know, sign letters of recommendation for their employees to get US visas. You know, I'm not break, I'm not, um, you know, it, it is legit reason that they're coming to the U.S., so I'm helping them. You know, those little things, sending a Christmas card, just popping up on QQ or Skype out of the blue to say, how's your family? You want to be more than just the person that contacts them only when there are problems. You know, you, you want to be their, their friend. And if you're a good person and they're making money with you and you're showing them that your interests are aligned and you're helping them grow more into the future, um, then when you have little problems, or when Walmart knocks on their door with a huge order, they're less likely to um, forget about you and your orders. Okay, now um, Pete wanted me to give something of real value that you could walk away with, and he asked me to bring a purchase order sample. I'm gonna do better than that. I'm gonna give you, anybody that leaves their business card at the back or with me, I'll give you a bilingual purchase order, the memo of understanding that we use about, you know, don't make any changes to form, fit, or function without letting us know. Please don't change the, very diplomatically saying things like, please don't change the raw material unless, unless we pre-agree on it. Um, and then the vendor code of conduct. That's not so much for the suppliers can, to worry about, but your customers are probably asking you, hey, your product is coming out of China, do you have a bilingual, enforceable, and robust vendor code of conduct? So these are the three items that I bundle together with every purchase order. Some buyers give a contract one time and then a purchase order with each order. That's dangerous because if you give the contract up front, which covers the code of conduct and the MOU, the supplier might forget about it every time, over time. So what I like to do is have the supplier see the whole package every time. You know, you're dangling the money, here's the next order. Okay, let's refresh ourselves about that non-compete clause. Let's refresh things about you're not gonna sell my idea to Walmart, whatever it is that's important to you. So leave your card and I'll send you the bilingual one. All right. Um, We've heard earlier about how important it is to negotiate at the right time with payments, and I like to lay out a roadmap in advance. Unless I'm ordering a, you know, big orders and working for a famous brand, I've never had a supplier say to me up front, okay, you just pay me 100% after delivery. If they do say that, it means that they have little risk or maybe they've built in a huge margin. So it's probably good that you don't hear that too often. But it will be a negotiation, all right, 50-50, 30-70, 30-40-30. Whatever it is, so I like to just get the first test order going by any means necessary. And then when it comes time to place the formal order, I say, all right, I'm ready to place the formal order. Let's look at the, con the, look at the pricing again. But also, let's lay out preferential payment terms for the next four or five orders. So I'm not telling you now, Mr. Supplier, that you have to give me net 30 terms, but if I pay on time and I bring the orders to the table that I'm telling you to, then by order four, I want to move from 30, 40, 30 to 20, 80, and eventually to zero up front and 30 after delivery. You don't have to be Walmart to pull this off, as long as you have a roadmap in advance. Okay, and I said it once, I'll say it again, please make sure the same name in Chinese is on the contract, the bank account, the business license, and the factory gate. That alone will protect you a lot. Okay, some people are interested in intellectual property and um, I could probably do five hours just on this topic. If you visit my, if you put in my name and my YouTube channel, you'll see a bunch of uh, hour-long seminars that I've done on, on how to register, limit exposure, monitor, and enforce. But let me hit a couple, um, the key points that, that you need. Um, first, China's first to register rather than first to market. If you only remember one thing about intellectual property, that's it. So say I'm your supplier 
and you're producing your first test order, and now you want me to put your brand on it, um, I can go to Beijing and for 200 bucks, roughly, register your logo in China. And now n nobody else except for the people that I appoint, meaning myself and friends, can actually ship your product out of China. So you couldn't leave me to go to another supplier. So register your trademarks, register your, your intellectual property up front. Okay, um, if you do have a great idea and you're walking around the trade show, don't show off all the secret sauce. You know, so many buyers are eager to find a supplier that they give them the engineering package, all the specs, sometimes even the target price. Um, you know, say you're in watches, but maybe you've got an idea for some kind of silicone band. Well, show them a watch with a, a competitor's product that's similar to yours. Narrow down the suppliers to two or three that are really good, and then you show them the secret sauce. So please don't be the buyer that's walking around um, building future competitors at these trade shows. How do you monitor the supplier? Well, I have some customers that have um, you know, really sensitive intellectual property and we hire investigators to get hired by the factory to give us updates daily on who the factory is selling to from inside the factory. That costs ten th tens of thousands of dollars, but it's possible. That's probably an extreme case. So what are simple things? Find out where your, your supplier is exhibiting. Have you or a friend go to the trade show and see if your product is for sale under their brand. Um, when you visit the factory, check out the showroom, visit their website, go into the stock room, check out your tooling. Is your tooling, maybe you haven't placed an order in six months, but you go into the tool room and it's all greased up or sitting in the mold, mold room making parts? That's a red flag. Um, Taobao, I love this. Um, if This is like the, the place where uh, suppliers dump product out the back door, whether it's non-compliant goods or defects or just counterfeits, or not necessarily counterfeits, but extra runs. You buy 1,000 units, the supplier wants to be safe, so they make 1,200 just to catch defects. Maybe there are 50 defects, so 150 units go out the back door. Taobao is where you're gonna find them at a great price. Okay, um, you can also be a dummy customer. Have one of your friends call up the same supplier, ask to buy the product that you think you have under exclusivity with the supplier and see if that seller offers to take the order. Okay, luckily, unlike the U.S., demand letters really work in China. Um, you know, I've issued dozens of demand letters, and they have effect of showing that the demand letter is only effective if it's from a Chinese lawyer in Chinese language to a Chinese entity which has assets in China. You could pay a lawyer in New York $10,000 to issue a, the most pretty, well-written demand letter. It will have no impact in China. So if you're going to use demand letters or consider litigation, it needs to be done on the ground. Okay. All right. Social compliance, regulatory compliance. Um, I'm going to rush this in here. Um, these are some fallacies you may have heard. Yeah, of course we have global liability insurance. Don't worry about this toy hurting any children in North America or Europe. Europe. We've got you covered. Even if that supplier does have global, global liability insurance, you're the importer of record. The lawyers in Germany and Canada are not going to go after some supplier on the other side of the world. They're going to go after you first. So it's up to us as buyers, especially for the importer of record, to uh, perhaps get our own liability insurance if possible, or at least make sure that the product is safe. That's so obvious. Um, don't worry, we own the IP. Um, the knockoff artists, generally aren't Chinese suppliers that see your product and then replicate it. If you're an American company, it might be another American company that takes your product, comes to a supplier in China and says, make this for me. The supplier doesn't do the research to find out if they're, if they're infringing on any other IP. Also, there's a lot of issues with, for example, if you have Bluetooth or um, uh, um, what's another common one? Like, you know, even something like Blu-ray on electronics or, or uh, all these marks, HMDI. You know, I, 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 didn't, I thought that that was kind of a technology. I didn't realize it was someone's IP until a while ago, a couple of years ago, when a, a product, um, a customer thought that they were getting HDMI cables from a recognized supplier. And these were HDMI compliant, but the supplier hadn't paid their fees to HDMI, so it all got confiscated and, and thrown away when it came to Los Angeles. So when the supplier says, we own the IP, okay, hey, Mr. Supplier, I believe you, and because uh, you don't want to cause a loss of, loss of face, but my boss back home and headquarters, we got some tight SOPs. 
I know you have the IP, Mr. Wong. I trust you, but just give me a copy of it just so I can put it in the file. And then you go do your research. So you don't want to go point for You're lying to me. You didn't pay your royalties. You, you kind of want to use a, a soft sell to get that information. Okay, um, you know, if you're worried about environmental compliance and China has gotten so much better than it was 15 years ago, but if you're worried about those issues, you know, you, you have to have a system in place to verify. Okay, um, I'll do this one really quick so I, we can wrap up and go to Q&A. But it's not enough to say is my, now we're talking about compliance, regulatory compliance in your home market. It's not enough to say I sent this watch to the testing lab and this watch is safe. Okay, fine. That means your design, your sample, perhaps your golden sample is compliant. But what happens if, uh, you know, a year from now, there's a sharp corner on it and some baby pokes themselves and gets infected and now, you know, who knows what happens, especially if a lawyer gets involved. So it's not enough to just say that my sample was compliant. You need a system where you're gathering the counter samples, you're filing them away, you're keeping your inspection reports. So God forbid some lawyer knocks on your door and says, hey, your product is non-compliant. You can sh show that you've made a reasonable effort to um, ensure that the sample which was compliant matches the production that's actually shipping. And it's not easy, especially when you're you know, selling on Amazon, you're just getting started. I'm not saying if you're you know, if you're just getting started and you got 10,000 units going out of watches, maybe you don't need to spend $100,000 on a compliance program, obviously. But if your plan is to scale up, at some point you're going to need to put this into your cost of doing business. So start thinking about it. Ask the laboratories. Ask consultants. You know, how much does it cost to make sure that I am not only compliant, but that I uh, have a system to protect me? Okay. Um, Customization, we've, I won't beat up on this because we've already explained before that it, the tooling is so important. I'm, I was so happy to, to hear uh, other speakers mention that it's important to own the tooling. Don't make the mistake of letting your chief financial officer say, hey, amortize the tooling because that's good for cash flow. That means that you own the tooling after, say, unit 10,000. The problem will be between unit zero and unit one, not between 9,999 and, and the 10,000 unit. So you want to be able to pull the tooling anytime you want and uh, you want to have a, a clear contract that you own it. Okay, um, really quick before we go to q and I'll just skip down to the bottom. As tomorrow, you're going to walk around the trade show, so don't make these two mistakes. Don't say, can you make this? Sure, with enough time and investment, I can make a space shuttle. I am going to have to hire NASA, but I can, in theory, get it done. So it's much better to say, um, hey, what are you making? Okay, that's similar to what I want. Uh, have you made this product before? Yes, when did you make it? Are you running parts now? Great. Can you show me a sample? And if the supplier's like, oh, it's going to take us a few weeks to get you a sample, or that means that they haven't run it before, or maybe they haven't um, um, done that product in the past. Um, also, be careful with this word sample. You and I are thinking, you go to the, the supplier downstairs, give me a sample. We're thinking that this is a sample of what production will look like if I place an order. The supplier might be thinking, this is a sample of what we could make if we get an order, but we've never made it before. So it's a representative sample. It's a golden sample. Uh, at one trade show long ago, I passed out count samples in order to get pricing. And I came back two years later. I was working on the same product. And I said, yeah, some, you know, I, show me your samples. And I got one of the samples that I had passed out two years before as their production sample. Um, yeah, I've had samples that were purchased at Walmart by the salesperson's cousin in the U.S. sent to me. And that's my fault for not saying that I want a production sample from your factory at, these H at, at, at this GPS coordinates. Um, <laughs> Seriously. And uh, so, you know, you, you don't just say, give me a sample. Give me a production sample. Give me a reference sample, prototype sample, handmade sample. These are all different things. So be careful what you're asking for. Okay, I think we've still got uh, a few minutes for Q&A. I told you I wouldn't pitch my company, but here's a shameless plug for the China Sourcing Academy that I'm associated with. So Neil and I, we've both been in Asia for 20 years, and we made like 30 hours of video tutorials. And Neil's given away a bunch of free stuff this month for trade show season. So China Sourcing Academy. I think there's some free factory audits and, and some um, introductory materials about how to find and manage suppliers. Okay. Um, now, before we go to Q&A, if you take away just two things, 
You know, spend the time to find the right supplier up front. Do your due diligence. The worst thing that you can do is jump into bed with the wrong supplier, give them some money for tooling, start production, and then find out, wow, they haven't made the space shuttle before. Okay, and uh, do it right or don't do it. As an Amazon seller, there's nothing wrong with starting small, buying from a domestic supplier that does the, the, the hard work of importing, change your product a little bit, build up your war chest, and then go direct to China and do it right. So. China direct sourcing has a whole set of headaches. It's not for everybody. It's better to delay yourself a year or two than to rush in and get yourself put out of business because you didn't uh, do things uh, safely. Okay, I'm going to open it up for Q&A, and I'll just leave some resources on the background. Please come down and say hello. We're at booth NH13 tomorrow. Um, also, my company, Passage Maker, is at the top. The law firm that I work with a lot, Asia Bridge Law. My blog at the China Sourcing Information Center, and then the Academy and the Blacklist. Whew, okay, that was a lot for 45 okay. minutes. I uh, hope there's one question. question. The, the hand up there was up first, so they get okay. the one question. Right. Because then we got to take a break. we got to prepare for the next session. And because Mike is going to help us moderate the next session, yeah, regrettably, you can't ask him questions right after this. But if you want to give him his, your business cards to get the, uh, the purchase order, the vendor agreement, yeah. what was the third one you said? Um, memo of understanding. The memo of Maybe understanding is put can together. Leave the cards at the back. Melissa. Right here, raise your hand, Melissa. We'll collect business cards on Mike's behalf. And I'll stick around later in the afternoon. Yeah, and you can to, talk to him later. So okay. there was a question. Thanks for getting your hand up fast. So, yeah, just a quick question is uh, who do you use or who should we use for bilingual Yeah, so um, I, you know, there's, I've seen every which way. I've seen um, exchange students back home translate it. Yeah, I prefer to use a Chi an English-speaking Chinese lawyer. And uh, the one that I mentioned here, like a purchase order, a couple hundred dollars for a template that you can, you only have to pay once, then you use it over and over again. A proper you know, non-disclosure, non-compete agreement that's tailor-made could be upwards of $400, so. Yeah, that's the one that I'm associated with that I work with. Okay, all right, thanks everybody and good luck on your sourcing adventures.